Good morning. I am Erica Vital Lazar. I'm a professor of creative writing at the College of Southern Nevada. The 2021 Las Vegas Book Festival and I are honored to bring you this virtual presentation of author Marita Golden reading from her work while engaging in a discussion with author Michelle Pettis. We will take questions from the audience after the discussion. I have to greet you formally, Marita. Good morning. Morning. And good morning, Michelle. And if you do me the honor, I have to give these beautiful introductions and they don't do you justice, the both of you, for your accomplishments and your work in the world, but I will attempt to. Marita Golden is the author of 19 works of fiction and nonfiction. Her books include the novels, The Wide Circumference of Love, Long Distance Life and the Edge of Heaven, and the memoirs, Migrations of the Heart, Saving Our Sons and Don't Play in the Sun, One Woman's Journey Through the Color Complex. Her most recent work of nonfiction is The Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. She is the co-founder and president emeritus of the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation and a veteran teacher of writing, serving as faculty of MFA graduate creative writing programs at George Mason University, Virginia Commonwealth University and John Hopkins, and has served as distinguished writer in residence at the University of the District of Columbia. Marita Golden is a cherished and exacting mentor to many, including myself, and as a literary consultant offers workshops, coaching, and manuscript evaluation services. I'm so grateful for you, Marita. I just, everything you do just makes the rest of us shine. Thank you, Erica. Yes. And I am meeting for the first time Michelle Pettis, and I'm already a fan. She is an author, speaker, food story finder, experiential eating expert and recovering food addict. Her first book, Leaving Large, The Stories of a Food Addict, features the award-winning essay, The Cake is in the Mail, a big city-born, small town bred, suburban living, nowhere near retirement, still Southern soulful sister. She's serious about Scrabble and her morning walks. Michelle Petty is a public media veteran who develops strategic partnerships, sponsorships, and alliances for Baltimore's NPR station. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. So Marita, we're gonna start with you to uh, just give us some of your magic, please, this morning. <laughs> well, thank you, Erica, for inviting me. And, you know, life is, is very interesting because Erica and I go back um, she was recognized when she was younger and she was an emerging writer. She's now emerged um, <laughs> for her brilliance by the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation, which I co-founded and which is now celebrating 31 years. So many of the young writers that we recognized early in their careers, um, including Tayari Jones, have gone on to become important writers, important teachers of others and important cultural ins uh, cultural institutioners, builders and influencers. So I'm really glad to be here with Erica and my new friend, Michelle, who um, I met through one of my workshops and who's just taught me so much. And uh, when I found out what she was writing her book about, I said, okay, we have to do a program together. So this is going to be a lively and informative discussion. So the strong black woman, how a myth endangers the mental and physical health of black women. First, some definitions. Um, the strong black woman complex or ideology is a cultural belief deeply rooted in the African-American community. And it is deeply related to our experience of enslavement. As enslaved people, we were not considered people. We were treated as chattel. And so we were designated strong, the strong men, the strong women, we could bear anything. And like a lot of oppressed groups, what we did was we turned language that was designed to diminish us into language that we would use to inspire and enhance us. And so the strong black woman is a belief that black women are strong. They have to be strong in all situations because they're bearing their individual weight, their individual dreams, 
They're carrying the dreams of their family. And they're especially carrying the dreams and responsibilities of the race. And so someone asked me the other day, what's the difference between being a strong white woman and being a strong black woman? Well, a strong white woman, often the center or anchor of her family is not dealing with systemic racism as a perennial factor in her life, as a factor endangering the health and welfare of her community and her family. And so for black women, being strong takes on an added dimension. And like, um, I'm sure if they're, if they're African-American women in the audience, you've, you've grown up hearing things like, um, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about, where we're taught to hold our emotions in, or you, know, you have to be twice as good, or you can't depend on anyone, so you have to be strong. And all of these um, adages, they do make us strong, but they also make us emotionally weak. And they also corrupt our relationships with others. And I'm really glad to be part of a increasing army of people, of, of women, of multi-generations who are now dismantling the dangerous belief that Black women have to be strong all the time. It takes an enormous psychological toll, an enormous physical toll on Black women. And we're the first generation of women that's had the language and the consciousness to look at that belief and to begin to dismantle it. So I'm going to read a couple of sections from the book and then uh, we'll uh, launch into a discussion. The strong black woman syndrome, which requires bl that black women perpetually present an image of control and strength is a response to the combination of daily pressures and systemic racist assaults. As we live and deal with racism and sexism, the strong black woman response becomes an automatic response. We see this as strength, the world does too. Buttressed and buffeted sometimes on all sides, we go on, move on, tapping down suffering and complaint. But the price must be paid. The strong black woman syndrome silences the healthy and necessary expression of pain and vulnerability. We are neither indestructible nor invincible. There is no one size fits all strong black woman suit that we can slip into in the shadows to vanquish threats. The strong black woman is a myth and fact internalized so deeply that even little black girls are treated like and assumed to be miniature strong black women. It is myth because its endurance rests on our need to assert control in the midst of the chaotic storm of racism, individual and systemic. It is myth because it rests on the foundation of tears we don't shed, pain we deny. It is myth because it is so deeply embedded in the collective unconscious of black women that it is assumed and largely goes unchallenged. All life begins is defined by and even ends with a story. The stories and myths we recreate, create, repeat be, and become sacred. They are designed to make and keep us strong. But stories are elastic and require revision over time or they risk becoming brittle dissolving into crumbs that leave us famished rather than fed. Stories are so powerful because at their core, they are aspirational, codifying what we long to be if we lived in a world where anything really was possible. Black women have made of themselves the heroes we dream of. And one of the reasons that this consciousness is so dangerous is because it, it helps us, it, it encourages us to deprioritize self-care. And currently African-American women are living in the midst of a health emergency. We are the fastest growing group developing dementia. We have off the chart rates of diabetes, high blood pressure, um, heart attack, cancer, obesity, and overweight. And obesity and overweight are just the, 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 the groundwork for which many of those other diseases develop. So when we say that the strong black woman complex is a danger, we mean that, I mean that literally, 
because strong black women don't go to the doctor. Strong black women don't believe that they can get therapy. Strong black women never say no to anyone. And so what we're talking about is a generational movement that has started that I hope will continue. I've been very gratified by the response to the book, which is a book that is very personal, it's political, it's journalistic, it's a little science, it's literary. And I've been really gratified by the fact that so many people feel that their story is in this book. Mm. Um, one of the most satisfying parts of doing the research was to go out and ask black women, who made you a strong black woman? How did you become a strong black woman? How have you healed from your trauma? And the stories that I was told were very deeply moving and personal. And they're kinds of stories that we don't hear out loud. We don't say out loud, but I'm going to read an excerpt from one of those stories. This is the story of a woman who grew up in a family where her father was schizophrenic. And um, because of the pressures in the marriage, her parents ultimately divorced. And after the divorce, her father was literally and figuratively erased from the family. Um, if there were pictures of him in the family uh, photo album, um, they were taken out. She wasn't allowed to talk about him. So that she got the message that anyone with mental illness or stress or strain was to be banished. So she went on and she went to college and she talked about what happened in her life. The anxiety, depression continued after college. Finally, it all came to a head. I was 29 years old, crying all the time, sleeping excessively. My energy felt low, heavy. I had trouble sleeping. I was quickly becoming addicted to a nighttime over-the-counter medicine for insomnia. Night after night, I drank the stuff. My soul felt unsettled. I felt miserable and so alone. I wanted help. I wanted to tell someone about being depressed all the time, but there was this argument raging in my head. What will happen if I tell the truth? Will I be erased like my dad? Finally, one night, just before I was getting ready to sip the medicine, a voice, I can only call it God, told me to go to therapy, told me I had nothing to fear, told me it would be all right. I was so disenchanted by how I saw my mother use the church to run from her problems that I hadn't been inside a church in 14 years, but God or one of his angels found me anyway. The first therapist immediately wanted to put me on drugs that I didn't feel I needed. The second therapist felt I would probably only need one visit. The third therapist, she just had this calm, this soothing energy, and I started crying the moment I sat down in the chair. She handed me a tissue and I just felt completely safe with her. I saw her twice a week for two years and she was excellent at helping me unpack everything I buried from the age of seven to 32. And she talked about sharing with friends that she was in therapy. She got so comfortable with the experience of healing that she talked about it with her friends and she helped to destigmatize that as a conversation and told me that she felt really pleased that her friends would come to her kind of quietly on the side and say, well, what's it like? I've, I've wanted to investigate that too. So the book, The Strong Black Woman is filled with my ruminations, my personal story, uh, the stories of researchers, health advocates, and women like these who are what I called new strong black women who are prioritizing self-care. Thank you. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Ooh, I have to take a moment. Um, after your reading and after reading that testimonial, and I, I must ask, and you answer partly with that testimonial, um, that there are some remedies to the strong Black woman, the SBW syndrome. What are some of those remedies or mitigating communities or factors that you found, Marita? Well, I found that in, in my life, my, my parents died when I was 21 and 23. And I decided that because I had a history of stroke, 
and heart attack that I was going to be very healthy. So I started very early in my 20s, a regimen of exercise, watching my diet, going to the doctor. Um, I, I meditate. I make sure that when I'm in a situation that I can't figure out how to deal with, if it's really, really hard, I seek out therapy or mental health. And I've been in therapy three times as I've been through my life. And so one of the things I think that African-American women really need to do is to say hello to themselves, mm. is to develop spaces and places where they are separate from family, separate from friends, in silence, in taking a walk, in meditation, but they are just being with Erica, being with Michelle, being with Marita, and getting to know their soul and their spirit. I think we also need to learn how to say yes to the things that we really want to say yes to, but are afraid to, and no to the things that we want to say no to, but are afraid to say no to. We fear that if we say no, we won't be liked, um, people will reject us, people will never respect us, but people will get over it, okay? And there's a multitude of ways to say no, as in, you know, I can't do that for you, but I'll show you, I'll send you a link. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have time to do that, but you know, why don't you ask so-and-so? And I also think that we've got to learn to love our bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah. just we just use our bodies like they're a, a car that we mm -hmm. never take to get a, a oil change. <laughs> we never get the transformation fixed. <laughs> you know, and our bodies are so beautiful and so loyal. Our bodies can be really screwed up. And yet they will continue to carry us. They will carry us overweight. They will carry us with, with high blood pressure. So mm. we owe it to ourselves to love our bodies in ways that transcend putting on makeup or just getting on the scale. And the number of black women who have not been to a doctor for a checkup, middle-class black women who have great health plans. Uh. It's, it's, it's amazing. So say yes, say no, and mean it. Love your body and, and say hello to yourself, your inner self. Wow, that's okay. You are giving me so much this morning that um, visits to your healthcare providers, that constant keeping up of what's going on inside is so important. And it seems as though, again, you point to the body, our bodies of, as black women um, constantly surveilled from the outside gaze. And what is ironic is that we do not take the time to surveil and tap in, like you said, say hello to ourselves. So I, I really want to know from you, Michelle, whether or not your journey with shifting your physical self, whether that was an answer to what Marita calls saying hello to yourself not just a shedding of numbers, weight, but perhaps a shedding of historical and psychological weight as well. Oh, wow. What a, que what a question. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what, um, Erica, it is, it is right on the money, right? It's right on the money. And so what I figured out after years of yo-yo dieting, is that I would lose weight and I would gain it all back, right? And that's that's a cycle, that's a pattern. I mean, that's pretty common. I mean, people have struggles with yo-yo dieting. And what happens is that you struggle and you use self-discipline, you use self-control, you use all that to get to a size 14. That's what I call the black woman's 10. You get to a size 14, <laughs> you know, but your head, your head is still a size 26. Uh, and so you gain the weight, you gain the weight back because you haven't made, you haven't done the, the mental work. And the mental work is one of the reasons why is I want to go back to Marita's book, why I love it so much is because she talks about the stories. And in reality is how we live, right? How we are is because, because of the stories that we tell ourselves, the stories that we tell ourselves about what's, what strong is, how to be strong and the stories that we tell us, tell ourselves about food about what food means and what food can do. Mm. And so when you when you asked me that, yeah, I had to, I had to, what I had to do, I had to do, 
and I just figured it out really like a couple of nights ago. I had to do, I had to do what Oprah does for a living. And that is, she asks the hard questions, she waits for the answer, and then she looks for change. And so once I started, and I got to the point where I was like, I have got to get off of this yo-yo. I can't do it anymore. I'm 63. I can't, I can't go down like this. Mm-hmm. I started asking the, the, the hard questions, not, not why do I keep yo-yo dieting, right? Not why this, why this, why me? Because that's a kind of a, kind of a victim question to me. The question became how, how do I change? How can this be better for me? And once I started asking those questions over and over again and start asking the right questions, the hard questions, and just started to sit, then the answers, the answers came up. The answers came up that it's all about this, this self-care thing. And we're talking about our bodies and taking care of our bodies. For, it, I, for so long, I was afraid of my body, right? Mm-hmm. And so if you're afraid of your body, you can't always honor it. If you feel like your body is going to betray you, right, and you're struggling with that, then that that causes some other that causes some other things. But the but the thing about the food and the, the overeating is that over it, it's a it's a way to suppress and express emotion. That's how that's how we use it. That's how we misuse it. That's how I misused it for forty two years. Mm-hmm. And instead of dealing with the emotions, dealing with mm-hmm. dealing, stand, not being afraid, right? Living in fear, right? Dealing with the sadness, dealing with the grief, dealing with the pain, food becomes like a, um, a an anesthesia, right? Mm-hmm. To distract mm-hmm. you from pain, distract mm-hmm. you from discomfort. And when you look at, you look at the plight, I don't want to say plight, but the situation of black women, right? Mm-hmm. We are dealing with all sorts of microaggressions, macroaggressions, mm-hmm. all sorts of pain every day and have for generations, have for generations. And, and what happens is that food, especially sweets and things like that, that becomes an easy outlet to mm-hmm. mask that. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and it's part of our language. I mean, we use food, you can hear, let me, let me you, you're not feeling good, let me bring you, you down, let me, let me bring you a little something, right? We, we use food to communicate how we care for one another. And um, that all I, I talk about in my book, but we need to separate, when we separate our, the situation that we're in, whatever, whatever, whatever we're dealing with from a, the food that's associated with it and not go to the food, but just go to, go to just addressing the emotion, then we can get on, then we can get on, onto a path of healing. And see, and see what the strong black woman complex has done is it shut down our emotions. Yes. Because we've had to deal so much with racism. The only emotion is work, show up, handle this. I've got this. I've got the answer. And so that um, I was talking to a 10 year old girl in our family about losing her father recently. And she told me that she hadn't cried because she was holding it in. And so black women hold in fear, hold in anger, because the, the double whammy of the, the, of the white society, that our families that depend on us for so much that we can never say no to. So we're really in emotional lockdown. And as you say, Michelle, food becomes this, this thing. And then the, the message we get from our community is, oh, don't lose too much weight. We right. like a woman with meat on her right. bones. Right. We like a woman right. with a big butt right. so that the messages are competing. And then young girls go on social media <laughs> and they see either a huge butt or a person who looks like they're anorexic. Mm-hmm. So black women are dealing with all of this. And you know, part, you know, part of it, Marita, I just, I, mm-hmm. what I love about your title, um, and how I feel like we're so aligned is that <laughs> this myth is endangering the mental and physical health of black women, right? Yeah. And so obesity is a disease. <laughs> Ob- obesity is a disease. And it stems from, I mean, there are, it's very complex. So just let me say that, right? But it, it does happen when you are eating too much. And so many times the reason that we're eating too much is because we're eating too much of the wrong things for the wrong reasons. 
and we're doing it unconsciously. And when we get to the point where we're not, there's this phrase that people say all the time. They say, my relationship with food. But we talked about this, right? Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, we have relationships with people. <laughs> we, have, we have relationships with people. We manage food. Mm. And the problem is, is that when we look to food for joy, when we look to food for entertainment, when we look for food for acceptance, because we're afraid, because we're frustrated, because we're sad, because we're all of this range of emotions, the stuff that we're going through, when we look to food for that, food will never provide it for us. Mm -hmm. We have to look to people for that and to look to, to, to take yourself, to, and you're a strong black woman, to go to your friend or call somebody and say, you know, I'm not feeling good. I'm feeling mm -hmm. sad. I'm hurt. You know, my feelings are hurt. That You have to rip that away. You have, you have to just step away from that. And, and we're not always comfortable doing that. We don't have, a, we don't always feel like we have a safe space to do that or a friend that, and that's why therapy is so important, right? Cause you've got, you've got this safe space to, to express yourself where there's not any, you know, sort, sort of condemnation or no, there's no judgment. There's, there's none of that. But, but when we have a circle of friends, when I call what I call angel warrior women, right? then you can you can do that and feel some comfort in it and you don't have you don't have to go to food to do something that it cannot do mm. i mean that's the and it and it's killing us it's robbing us of our good health and it's robbing us of our ability to connect with people because we're connecting with food mm. and when we connect with people that's when that's that's where we get our strength there's some inner stuff but when you've got you know people surrounding you and supporting you that that's where you can go when you when you need some weak side help and you can ex, you know be okay with the fact that you you know you you're on, you got a weak side <laughs> it it sounds like what you're both are saying is that the relationship that we must have <clears throat> is that relationship of truth that we are honest about feeling fear or honest about our lack of joy. We do all this performance. And Marita, you have this section in the book that's entitled Fear, Loathing, Love, Our Bodies Inside Out. And as you begin that chapter, you list some very meaningful, pivotal women whose bodies and talents we look to, Ethel Waters, Ma Rainey, Big Mama Thornton, Lizzo. We can add Beyonce, as you mentioned earlier, Rihanna, these bodies, these performers, we see their strength first. We see their physical presentation. We're doing all that we can to perform to that level in our professional and our personal lives. But all we're doing is doing the outer kind of work, the layering on of makeup, um, the posture, um, the tending to the outside, but not really developing that hello, that relationship with ourselves, which takes an amount of vulnerability and trust. So once you do that, trusting yourself to hold it, it seems as though we have to trust our friends, our circle of angel warriors to hold it too. We have to risk something. There's an element of risk. Well, I think that those of us who are actively engaged in um, these health practices need to begin feeling a sense of responsibility for our sisters who are not. Oh. Um, one of the women in the book I interviewed, and she's a really strong writer. And um, I said to her a while back, I said, you know, your writing is so powerful and so strong, but I'm, I'm lately sensing a disconnect between the way you present, the way you, you present physically and the power of your writing. I don't know what's going on, but there's just some sort of disconnect. Now, I didn't say you need to lose weight, you look sloppy. I just said there's this disconnect. And then about a month ago, she emailed me and she thanked me for saying that because she said, you know, what you were seeing was the fact that I needed to go back into therapy. Wow. I had stopped saying no when I really wanted to and yes when I really wanted to and you were picking up on that and just by saying that that little thing you know I see a disconnect that got me thinking and that got me back into therapy so I think that we really have to find ways to as angel warriors 
gently embrace our sisters. We even have to risk people, like a friend of mine said the other day, she said to a friend, um, well, how's your therapy going? So a friend said, how did you know I was in therapy? So she said, well, you know, you told me a while back and her friend was kind of ruffled. And then she mentioned my book and she said, this is a book that you need to read because there's no shame in being in therapy. So we have to risk that our sister friends may put their hands on their hips for a minute. But the main question here is your health is your health. So you can be mad with me all you want, but I'm here for you to help you be healthy. Absolutely. You know, Marita, I want to just um, tell a quick little story about being being in therapy because I've been through thousands of hours of it and spent thousands of dollars for it over a, a number of issues. And very quickly, um, my mother died, you know, also when I was very young, but I didn't have a close relationship with her when I was growing up. And I grew up with my grandparents. And after my mother died, I felt like I needed to go to therapy and just deal with some grief, grief issues that could not be resolved, that I couldn't get through. And um, I did, right? I signed up, you know, and, you know, went to my little, little local social service center and subsequently had a conversation with my grandmother. And so as I was telling my grandmother about, you know, going to counseling, my grandmother said to me, and this was like 19, this was 1983. No, I'm sorry, this is 1981. Um, yeah. She says, are you, you're so weak, you need to go see a psychiatrist? Mm -hmm. This is what she said to me. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, back. It's not a question of being weak. I'm mm -hmm. just, I, sometimes you need outside support and blah, blah, blah. That's so I said what I said. Like, and then like the next session I canceled. Like, the, the, but, but she, was in, she was in my head, but here's the thing. The next session I canceled, I didn't go back to therapy again for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I went 10 years mm -hmm. later, my grandmother had died. Mm -hmm. And I went, I went because I was so depressed. I was working all day, right? Working all day, you know, banging it out at the job, just, but didn't feel normal. Did, didn't, I couldn't understand what this eating thing was all about. It was just, I, I felt, I felt crazy. I mean, that might not be the, that might not be the, you know, the, Politically correct. Politically, co politically correct thing to say, but that's how I feel. Sometimes it works. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I and I went to my doctor. I went to my doctor, who's a black man, and told him I felt like I needed therapy. And he said, "Are are you depressed?" I said, "I don't know what I am, but I need to talk mm -hmm. to somebody." And he um, recommended a black female psychiatrist. And that and I got to that point after I had been doing some research on my own. And I went to Dr. Fuji, I'll call her out. Uh, I went to Dr. Fuji and y'all, I was so blocked. I was so blocked, I couldn't even talk to her. Mm -hmm. I had to write. I had, I, I mean, it was like, it was a months before I could talk to her directly. And because I asked, can I just write? And so I would just write the stories and I would tell her what was going on with me. And um, so I did that till I got a little better. And that, and I, that helped me what I thought was what I thought was a problem. We ended up dealing with another problem, and then, and then about five years later, I went into therapy again and, and dealt with the, dealt with the second sure, problem. Sure. But it was but it was a process, and I will tell you, I literally sit here on today in this room and tell you that therapy saved my life. Mm -hmm. It saved, it, you know, it, it's it saved my mental life for sure. It might have saved my physical life, and I and I will <clears throat> tell anybody if you. If you think you need to go, you need to go. If it just kind of like crosses your mind. And and I want to tell the story to let people know it, it's all right. And I have friends now that tell me that they went because of what I told them, you know, in, 19, in 1981, right? Um, in, in, in spite of what my grandmother said. And it, is, it, and it is a powerful thing. It is a powerful thing to, to be able to say, I don't have all the answers. I don't know what to do next. And 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 there's a level of us that feel a portion of us, I think, that, that sometimes we're afraid, we're afraid to say that we can't do something. Because we we tie it so much to our value and worth and what bring. Well, if I can't, if I can't do this, then who am I? If I, you know, if I can't, if I can't be at church every Sunday and be on and be on the usher board and be on the hostess board and and do all if I, you know, who am I? What is my worth? What is my value? If I can't take, if I can't take care of my my parents, if I can't take care of my cousin's parents, you know, if I, you know, if I can't, if I can't do all these, if I can't do all these things that are expected of me, 
who am I? Mm. Why, you know, why am I here? What's my purpose? And so we have to like sit with that. That's mm. a question that we have to sit with and then look for inspired change. Oh, thank you for that, Michelle. That reminds me of something. Um, I'm going to try my best to, to read that excerpt from your book, Marita, because it's such hard knowledge about ourselves. It's the hard knowledge that Michelle just pointed to that we can't do everything and that we are suffering from grief. There's a section in SBW when you say, African-Americans carry the mark, the stain, the weight of PTSS, the lies and silence and hypocrisy that renders impossible the kind of scorching, cleansing, and redemptive discussion about the impact of slavery and racism in America that we need as a nation has infected whites with the intergenerational disease of racism in blacks. And this is the hard part with a mutilated sense of self and bodies that are devouring us. How do we come to that place when we can look at a statement such as that? Marita, how did you arrive at a place when you can write and process through that knowledge? And what do we do with it? Well, this is a book that I wrote during the lockdown. And it's a book that I wrote after I found out that I, sometime in the past, had two silent strokes. And I realized that I was concerned about having had two silent strokes, which are very, very common. But I felt good that I knew that the lifestyle that I'd adopted had saved those strokes from being fatal because my mother had two strokes, one serious, one fatal. But because I'd adopted a particular lifestyle very early on, my strokes were silent and they were not fatal. Um, so that when I was writing the book, there was sort of the external pressure of the lockdown, um, the pandemic, the, the assassination, the murder of George Floyd, everything that was going on, my own questions about my health, mortality. And so I was in a place where I, one of my friends said, it felt like the book was written when I was um, possessed. And I said, you know, kind of I was, because I, when I started researching about black women's health and where we really are with this, I felt that this is an emergency. I felt the book was water to put out a fire. And I was writing to save our lives. Mm -hmm. And it meant that mm -hmm. I was willing to tell as much truth as possible. One of my most tender sections in the book is where I wrote about my sister, the death of my sister um, who died of dementia, rheumatoid arthritis. And she was adopted mm -hmm. 10 years uh, older than me. And in our family, we she was told the lie that she wasn't adopted because back in those days that you did. So when she found out, when she suspected that she was and found out that she really was, the family continued to lie to her. Mm -hmm. So she grew up with the burden of wondering why her birth parents gave her up, wondering why the family lied, and then became a woman who had, who raised five boys on her own, mm -hmm. but who felt she had to be strong. She had to laugh. She had to support everybody. And, and I write about how was it for her to be dealing with this question of identity, the lies from the family, raising five boys alone, and always having to be strong. And recently there was a memorial service for my sister and everybody talked about how strong she was. Mm -hmm. Oh, she was so strong. But you know, the most interesting comment that was made, one person said, you know, I could always go to her with my problems. She knew everything about me. Mm. I didn't know anything about her. And that said it all. Mm. So in our families, the strong black woman, you know, is, is dying day by day, bit by bit. And it corrupts our relationships. I asked my son, have you ever seen me? Did you ever remember seeing me cry? He said, yeah. He said, remember that time I got in trouble and you all were trying to get me out? He said, I saw you cry. I said, what did it mean to you? He said, it told me that you weren't invincible. It told me that I had to take responsibility for my actions. That's what it told me. 
So we need to, our children to see us cry. One of the women I recently interviewed in the book, um, her since the book has been published, her partner, her life partner died at 33 of a heart attack. So she talked about um, letting her stepdaughter, who was very close to her, see her cry. She said, mm -hmm. I don't show all my tears, but I do let her see me cry. And then she knows that she can cry with me and we can comfort one another in addition to therapy, but she models that. Now that's something that her mother could not do. So we're a brave new world yeah. of brave new strong black women who are trying to model something else. Mm. You know, Marina, when you, when you talk about that, that, that not crying and, and, and being strong, the thing that hits me really is that one of the things that I feel like that is, that we get robbed with on this is that when we suppress and ignore the pain, the possibility of pain, part of that has to do with the fact that I won't live through the pain, that this pain will be so severe, it will kill me. Wow. Sure. And I, sure. I won't live through it. Sure. But when we don't acknowledge the pain in our life, yes. Yes. the joy that is on the other side, we don't get a, we don't get a chance to acknowledge that either because we mm -hmm. have to have them both. And if we numb ourselves to pain, we also numb ourselves to the absolute highest joy that we can actually have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this became clear to me in therapy because for mm -hmm. so many years I was numb and I went through therapy to to, to start to, so I could be exposed because I want, I wanted to feel some stuff. I wanted to feel some other stuff other than just that numbness. And I remember, um, you know, here we go, Erica, a wine, a, a boy wine story. But, um, I, 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 I remember I was in, I was in a relationship and it was kind of, you know, out of, uh, some, after I had kind of gotten this awareness of myself and the relationship dissolved. And I was crushed. And I felt every bit of the crushing weight of losing that relationship. And I just cried. I cried. And but I will tell you, they, it was as much as I was upset, it was happy tears because I was like, oh my God, I feel this. I feel, I feel, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, mean, I know it sounds nuts. Yeah. But, and yeah. I remember, yeah. I remember when it happened, I had an angel warrior. She worked downtown on K Street. This thing had just happened. And I went to her office and they wouldn't let you in. in you know, we had to sign in at the desk, right? You, we couldn't go right up. So I was at the desk and I'm like, barely, I'm barely holding myself together. I'm trying to hold it down, but I'm feeling it. She comes down off the elevator. And as soon as she comes off the elevator doors, mm -hmm. I break out. <laughs> to emote, to express, to connect. And part of that connection comes when we, when we rub up against one another. Mm. And rubbing up against one another isn't always going to e be easy. It's not always going to be smooth. It's not always going to be lovely, but we have to be okay with that. We have mm. to, on some level, we have to learn to be okay with discomfort. Because yes. when we sit and are okay with discomfort, and rather than eating through it, trying to mask it, yeah, it just yeah. makes the discomfort longer. Yeah. Because if we sit with the pain and the discomfort, we can figure out how to get out of it. But if we pretend that it doesn't exist, we just prolong it. We mm. just prolong it. You know, it occurs to me listening to that story, I could feel the release, Michelle. I could feel the release of that moment. And you're right, it makes you feel the weight of the grief, but also the, the joy that comes after just giving yourself permission but it seems we only give ourselves that type of permission when it is heartbreak, which involves others, 
or at the death of another, when do we come to the place where we just release out of love for ourselves? We just wanna weep with joy because of the, the overwhelming bounty of that feeling we have for ourselves and for our sisters. When do we get to that place? I guess that's a question for you both. How do we get to that place when we just weep with joy and pleasure and sometimes grieving for ourselves, allow ourselves to weep for ourselves? How well, I, it takes I've, I've, I've long, I've been developing the habit of celebrating myself for a number of years. Um, as a writer, writers are particularly neurotic and we feel that we can't celebrate ourselves until we're at the end of five years of writing the book. Yeah. But oh, I, I celebrate myself with every draft I do. Uh, my last novel, I would, I always send a, a draft to my agent and she looks at it and then she'll get back to me with comments. And I remember when I was writing The Wide Circumference of Love, um, you know, I'd spent a long time researching, talking to people and I'd done a really good, good song, first draft of a part of it. And I realized, I said, you know, I said, damn, you've done good. You've researched, you've talked to all these people. You know, look at all the work you put into these 130 pages. Nowhere near finished, but 130 pages. And so be even before she got back to me with her comments, I said, I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to buy tickets to see the Universal Circus. <laughs> and I went to buy tickets for my husband and myself. And we went to the circus to celebrate. And I will treat myself to dinner at a nice restaurant. I'm always looking for reasons to celebrate anything, mm. anytime. And that's really hard for, mm. for black women because, you know, do I deserve it? You know, so that's a, that's a, that's really important. And crying, I have been known to make myself cry, to release tension. That is, I know there's something building up. And I oh, believe just like the best actresses in Hollywood, I can make myself cry because there's <laughs> something about the release of those tears. You know, the tears do release toxins. They do release stress. So um, we need to cry and for joy and we need to celebrate mm. yeah. for no reason. We don't need a yeah. reason to celebrate. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Just waking up, right? Waking yeah. up and being able to breathe. Yeah. Well, you know, Erica, I, I want to um, share just a little bit about, about that question that you asked. One of the things that I do um, that I encourage the people in my group to do when I'm, when I'm uh, coaching and trying to get to this mind, body, heart transformation place is to se spend a day, spend a week, and celebrate the women around you. If you, yeah. if you see somebody else is looking good, tell them they're looking good. If they might not be looking that good, but tell them anyway, because they <laughs> might need it, right? Call somebody, right? Call somebody that you haven't connected with in a long time uh -huh. and tell them that they are fierce. Yes. Tell them that they are a slayer. Because here's the, here's the thing. When you lift up other people, right? When you lift up other people and honor the good and the graciousness and the beauty and all of that in somebody else, then it gives you permission to honor it in yourself, especially if you're not used to doing it. If you're not used to doing it, you get in the practice, in the habit of saying it. If you can't say it to, to yourself, say it to somebody else. And you, you, and you feel, you give yourself permission to say it to somebody else. And then you can start to flip it and say it and say it to yourself. And that, and that is so, so, so mm -hmm. important. That's how we, that's how we lift each other up. Mm -hmm. And do you know, I just recently found out that Rosa Parks practiced yoga and was a Buddhist. Yes, yes, yes. Wow. And Coretta wow. Scott King was a vegan and also practiced mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have these early pioneers in the yes. kind of care. Mm -hmm. It is not foreign to us. Exactly. We have a tradition of self-care. Yes, and uh, the last thing before we, I, I was on a conversation with uh, one of the therapists that I interviewed for the book and we talked about the black church and she said, it's so interesting that black women will so often say, you know, that, that the church is where I feel so safe. And so she said, wait, is this the same church where you are not allowed to stand in the pulpit because you're a woman? <laughs> is this the same church where if you're a victim of sexual abuse by uh, a deacon, you will be turned out of the church 
but the deacon will be exalted? Is this the same church where the women do all the work, get but get very little of the praise? Okay, okay, no problem. That's your church. But we have this relationship with the church, then we have this relationship with, with Jesus, but that's another conversation. But we need some new spaces, some new spaces where we feel safe. Oh, beautiful. This feels like church. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> In the best of all possible ways. And I, I want to ask you, I want to go back, Marita, to the fact that you have championed so many beautiful, pivotal writers, Nettie Okorafor, Brett Bennett, you mentioned Tyere Jones earlier. How did you come to recognize the fearlessness of this voice that Michelle Pettis has as well? How did you all meet? What was that? Well, mm -hmm. Michelle... Uh, enrolled in one of my workshops. It was a, an, age, an agent ready workshop. I do writing workshops for fiction, nonfiction, memoir. Um, and I also do agent uh, workshops about the basics of the publishing industry, how to find an agent, how to make sure your manuscript is ready. And um, Michelle signed up and the minute she shared her, her sample draft agent letter, I said, oh my God, why are you here? You don't need this workshop. And then after the workshop, I mean, I made some suggestions, but after the workshop, then we became friends and she sent me her book. And I said, oh my God, this is, this is really, really very powerful. And as we got to know each other a little better, I said, well, when I do um, presentations around the new book, I'm going to be in conversation with health experts, health advocates, other black women. So I have to be in conversation with you. Mm. And I, I, can't, I can't even tell you how, how grateful, how grateful I am for, to you, Marita. And I, 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 I'm telling you, I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a post or something that says, oh, Marita Golden like my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is what it looks like. <laughs> But but just I, I do want to add add something on on to what Marita said and and let you know a little bit of, about the impact that she has made on me. Um, you know, being a new writer. You know, she talked about being neurotic. You know, being a new writer, I have all the jitters that a new writer has. And what she said that just made a shift for me. She said, "Tell your story, write your own story." And you know, she said, "Send it out, right." And I had some initial interest and the interest was slow, but she said, just stick with your story. And that has been, has been so grounding for me. And I started uh, going, the, looking for an agent route, thought it was going to turn out that way, but shifted over to self-publishing. And part of that happened. Part of that happened really because of what Marita said. Somebody was searching around. I guess they had read another story that I had written and they messaged me on Facebook. And they told me that they had read a couple of stories and they talked about how those stories impacted them and how they changed them and how they were looking for more. She found, I mean, she found me on Facebook and sent and, and wrote to me directly. And when this woman wrote to me directly, I knew I had to self publish the book and get it out as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So that's when I ditched the agent route and I'm going to self publish it because, you know, if I find an agent, how long is that going to take? If I go to a publisher, how long is that going to take? It could be a year. It might be a year and a half. It could be less, but maybe more. Um, and in the meantime, my sisters are dying, right? My, my, my sister is dying emotionally. And, and, and getting weaker and weaker by the day when all, if they just knew they could change their story, they could rewrite the story of how they manage food and completely transform their lives. I just feel committed to that. And see, one of the things that happens is that you have a story, but the publishing industry often has a preconceived notion of what a black woman's story looks like and how a black woman's story should be told. And so, very often these publishers, well, I mean, I was told by many big publishers that I did not have enough Twitter followers. I did not have enough Facebook followers that I needed to do this book with a high profile, well-known therapist. Well, you know, I'm not going to talk about my response to that because you can probably figure what it was, <laughs> but the thing about the publishing industry is that many of the most radically authentic voices are pushed to the margins, do not fit into the box. They have a little system they use. And I could tell by the response to 
Michelle's book that she was going to have that issue of you don't quite fit into this box. Mm -hmm. The work is powerful, if but you have to hold on to your vision and your voice. That's really important. The same industry that wants to give you a contract will also ask to mute you at the same time. So mm -hmm. you have to hold on to your own voice. Wow. So I'm going back to that story of someone telling Marita Golden that they need more. <laughs> Oh no, that's a thing. That's a real thing. That's a real oh, thing. All I can think of is, don't they know who they're talking to? <laughs> Actually, they may not. Right, well, clearly they didn't. They didn't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they know now. But this urgency that you both have in getting this message out to Black women so that we might save ourselves, save our sisters, save our families, rewrite our narrative. As you have done that kind of life-saving heart work, was there any statistic, any information that you discovered about yourselves, about who we are as Black women that an amazed you, um, frightened you, hardened you? Well, for me, it was, it was just, see, I had done some health research around black people when I was writing the book, The White Circumference of Love, which deals with dementia. So I sort of, I, I knew that systemic racism was a factor in our ill health, but to then really zero in specifically on black women and the ways in which the combination of our attitude about our bodies, um, our emotional, our, our separation from our emotions, mm -hmm. combined with the forces that really undermine us in so many ways, systemic racism, being a, being a factor that is in our blood, systemic racism is now recognized as a factor that is in our bodies, a stressor in our bodies, like DNA, like cells, like blood. Mm. And that gives, that is like a 2.0 to diabetes, a 2.0 to obesity. And we don't really think about that. You know, we think, oh, I'm stressed. Oh, I'm overweight. Oh, I have that. But we're not thinking that in combination with the daily stresses, we're at 2.0, 3.0. And that's why it's so important to have these regular daily practices that release stress and allow us to find joy because we cannot snap our fingers and get rid of all the fast food restaurants in our neighborhood. We can't snap our fingers and change a food desert into a, a neighborhood that has all the, the, the food outlets it should have, but we can take a walk. We can go to the doctor. We can change our attitude about our health and get as, if we protected our health the way we registered to vote for Barack Obama, the way we stood in line for hours and hours to vote for Barack Obama, we need to stand in line that for the doctor. Like I said, church, yes, 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 yes. yes. So um, the question about what surprised me or some sort of statistic, um, I don't know if this is a statistic that surprised me, but what did surprise me in, in my work, because I'm like, after I started this journey, what I thought I was going to end up doing was, you know, coaching people was coaching people on changing their lifestyle and becoming, having a brand new attitude about food and movement and all that. Um, but it's important, what I feel like my work is, is helping people rewrite their stories, but that's not where the focus is. But what I found in that, one of the exercises I would have people do is to write and find their happy place. Mm -hmm. And so at first I would say, because your happy place is your goal. It's, it's just another name for gold as to why you, why you want a better body, why you want to look and show up and feel differently. 
what's the reason? So mm -hmm. that's your happy place. And if you can stay focused on your happy place, you can achieve it. And so I was all excited about this happy place concept until in so many of my groups, women couldn't identify a happy place. Wow. They didn't have one. They couldn't, they, it, it, it was first, okay, not even feel like they deserved one. I mean, so that, I, I was like, what? You know, they, didn't, they really didn't have one between being a caretaker, between working, between the church, between children, between grandchildren. They didn't have this, they didn't have a place for themselves mm -hmm. or even des thought that they deserved a place because they were so busy serving these other outside places. And so see, I yeah. had to step yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Go when ahead. I was doing my research, Dr. Kanika Bell down in Atlanta, therapists, she did a study of black women, therapists, psychologists, and their black female clients and surveyed them about peace, mind, joy, peace of mind, happiness, and joy, and found that for many black women, they believe that peace of mind, happiness, and joy is something for white women, that black women are too busy and should be too busy, have to be too busy surviving, have to be too busy protecting their families, have to be too busy for joy yeah. and peace of mind. So that we don't believe that's something that we deserve that or that we have time for. So it's deeply embedded in the strong black woman complex. And Marita, that statement, that last thing that you that you said, that is so heartbreaking to me. And I will say this, the I, I won't say I won't call it an unintended consequence, but it was certainly an unexpected consequence that until I lost the weight and figured out how to manage it and got to and I and got to my ideal weight, what I have found and what part of my message is and what I really want black women and really in anybody to get is on the other side, mm. on the other side of managing this body that is not serving you is more power. If you think you have, if you think you have power, peace, freedom, confidence, let's enjoy now, if you think you have it, just wait to lift the weight of all of this off of you. It's even better on the other side in a way, in ways that you can't even imagine in ways that you can't even imagine because you, there, there, there's no way that you can. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think that, you, you know, you, you think about your, your body and it, maybe it's in, in health and you've got all this mental stuff going on, but once you clear away all that stuff, once, once you work through it, it's better. It's better on the other side. It's better in power. It's better in peace. It's better in pride. It's better in freedom. It's better in confidence. It's better in joy. But you don't know it. You don't even know what you're not missing. You don't know what you don't know. <laughs> hmm. So you're talking too about not the weight itself as an obstruction to our mind, joy, and our peace. But if you are using it as a distraction from mind, joy, and peace, that is something you have to get to the bottom of. You have to find out what that core relationship is between what you're carrying and what you're not carrying. And you, your true feeling, your true fears, your grief, your true joy, all of it has to be authentic and deeply felt. We have to allow ourselves to feel. Right, right. That's, that's exactly true. That's exactly true. And here, and here's the other, I will tell you the other thing that I found that was not surprising, but it's real. And I found it even in my own self in going through this journey is that I spent so many years eating out of emotional reasons for frustration, sadness, tired, thirsty, angry, for reasons that had nothing to do with hunger and nourishment that I didn't even realize how to eat for the right reasons that we don't even know what real hunger is because we we eat so much just because the food is there we eat so much just because somebody offers it to us we eat so much just because it's free we eat you know we eat so much just because it's dinner time we so we we're eating for reasons that don't have to do with how how our body is going to benefit based on what our body needs that we don't we don't know how to do it for real so it becomes a matter of unlearning and recognizing okay this this twinge that i feel in my stomach it's not really hunger 
this guy really hungry. It's just because somebody just walked in here and got on my last nerve that I feel like I want to go do something. Right? That's not hungry because I just ate, but I feel like I want to go pick up something. And so once we don't eat, but go deal with the person that just got on our last nerve and say what we need to say or manage that, then, <laughs> then that feeling goes away. Oh, wow. So that is really how we come. We don't know what real hunger is. We don't. We don't. That describes on so many levels, not just the physical gnawing of the belly, but just the hunger period. That hunger, we have to embrace it along with the rest. And I have to ask you both, do you have a journal component to um, your books, to these uh, new works that you are birthing to the world, it seems that journaling for the readers, for the Black women, and for all people who encounter this book, it would seem that a journal element is, is crucial, necessary. Well, I'm working on a follow-up book that is workbook and journal. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. So please let us do this again um, continue this conversation. And because I want to follow you, can you please tell the rest of us, how do we stay in touch with you? How do we find you and follow you? Well, you can visit my website, maritagolden.com. You can purchase the book on my website through any of your Amazon or any of your other book, book venues. Um, on my website, you will see my other books. You will see my blog where I write about uh, life and literature. I'm on Facebook at Marita Golden Author, Marita Golden. I'm on Twitter, Marita Golden, and I'm also on Instagram. So I would love to hear from you. And also there's information about my 2022 classes on my website. Beautiful. Thank you, Marita. And if you're trying to reach me, um, you can reach me uh, at I am brand new now at gmail.com. That is my email address. I'm also on Instagram. I am brand new now on Instagram. I also have a YouTube channel. I am brand new now on YouTube. And also my website for my book is leavinglarge.com. You can, right now you can download a free chapter. You download a free chapter, you'll be notified of um, when the book is being released, which we're moments, really moments away from, <laughs> or, or days away from. So you can find that at, at leavinglarge.com. Beautiful. And um, I think we're going to take some questions uh, if our tech is working. And I think I have one more question for you both. And that's going to take us back to something you touched upon earlier. Did you ever reveal something on the page, Marita, that scared you, that frightened you? All the time. Yeah. And when that happens, I know that I'm writing something that's very necessary for me to write. And it's necessary for me to write. Um, it's going to be a truth that my readers will connect with. Beautiful. So that's something that you impart to your students as mm -hmm. well? Definitely. Right. The right. Story. What scares you? Scares you. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did, did you have a moment like that yourself, Michelle, where something you exposed, you may have exposed it for yourself the first time as it was written on the page and it frightened you. Right. You know, you know what, um, as I, as I was writing, the stories came really quickly. Like once I had the, the, the first breakthrough story, things, things just started bubbling, bubbling up, really. Emotions started bubbling up, connections started bubbling up. And sometimes I will tell you what happened to me. I would write and then I would have to stop. I would have to stop for like a couple of weeks because, of, because there, was, there was so much that I had, had to process. And there were, there were so many things that as I was writing, I was like, oh my goodness, I forgot that I had forgotten that that had happened. And I, 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 I'll just really tell you, you know, one, 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 one quick question. I was, I was writing a story about how my um, eating habits kind of got out, got out of control when I was in elementary school. And um, yeah, I just got, I, was, I always felt like I was the biggest kid on the block. 
and I was working with the editor and I was working with the editor that ha happened to have be a man. And he said, well, were you so big? You had, you said you had a swing set in your backyard. Did the swing set creak when you, <laughs> 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 and so, and so what? And then he started, he started asking me about clothes and things. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I, the, sw the swing set never shook or anything, but I did have to wear a girdle. I, I, my, you know, my grandmother pushed me in a girdle. I mean, I was 10, I was 10 years old and I was, but until he brought up those questions, I had, I had forgotten about that. And I had, I had forgotten about the trauma of that. And once he brought that question up, it also helped me to connect why the gold that kept me going on this last time was in my closet. I mean, and even now, even now, the thing that keeps me centered is like, you know, I just, I, I originally just, I, I, this is going to sound shallow. I really just wanted to wear cuter clothes. That's why, that's why I was so committed. I just wanted, I wanted to look better. And then after this work happened, it became something deeper. It became mm -hmm. something more important, but that in a, in a, for, for someone that has never had this issue, but I mean, everybody else, I mean, there was a kid, I was running around and I, you know, I was, I was wearing a girdle. You need something to keep you in girl. <laughs> so, but, but it was something that I had repressed for a long time because, it, you know, but, but here's that strong black woman thing. I felt traumatized by it, but I couldn't show it. Yeah. And so that's like the strong black girl, right? All that, all that stuff that happens to you, all those microaggressions that happened to you as a kid, especially back then. And then I'm growing up in the segregated South, right? Stuff, stuff comes at you, but you still, you have to pretend that it's not touching you so you can, so you can move through it. You can't let, you can't let it keep, you have to keep going. And that, and that's how we are as black women. That's how I see all my sisters that are slaying in their jobs. They're, they're moving up the corporate ladder, the career, they're doing everything in their career, but their bodies are showing, their bodies are showing that they have, they have stuff that they aren't dealing with, that they don't know how to deal with, that they can't deal with. I know that really didn't, that was a different answer than what you were looking for, but I just kind of got off the there. Well, you need something to keep you in, girl. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how that can keep you in in several ways, and those are the ways that we've been talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Well, I thank you all for this time this morning. I believe our link to our questions Um uh, we've not been able to access that. So I, I have a feeling that many questions uh, were probably answered in our time together, just through our being together and talking frankly with one another. I hope you don't mind, Marita, if I announce that along with the Strong Black Woman, you also have a re-release uh, that's emerging in 21 as well. So you'll have two books on the shelf and that's with McSweeney's Press. And so I, again, I look forward to doing this with you all in future, uh, perhaps live here in Vegas, Michelle and I, we were commiserating over that lack of touch and most of all, just warmth and smell. <laughs> um, and we're also holding a right now event on Friday. And we're hoping that you will join us um, as we talk about writing and pushing through and being inspired to write. Do you all have any last thoughts before I let you go, which I hate to do. I could talk to you all all morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I just want to thank you for, for this. And I'm so glad that I was able to do it with two amazing women who I, I deeply respect. And I'm glad that you're in my life. So my parting words, love your body, love yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Ramita. Thank you, Erica. And um, I just want to say, remember, it's not about the food. It's about the food story. Beautiful. Thank you all. Thank you. I look up to you all so very much. You are a lodestar. You are a reminder for me to become a star in my own universe as well as we must, but that I am in the company of supernovas. So thank you for being the example. Thank you. Thank you, Erica.